Hello and welcome to this video on why airplanes are riveted and not welded. To begin with, let me start by sharing the screen so you can follow along with the PowerPoint that I'm going to use. My name is Girish Kelkar and I am a welding consultant operating as WJM Technologies. And you're going to find this video on my YouTube channel, The Weld Nugget. So why are airplanes riveted and not welded? So let's look at quickly at the history of structural joining. Before World War I, everything was riveted. From time around 1900s to 1950s, a lot of the welding technologies that we use today for structural joining were invented, such as shielded metal arc welding, submerged arc welding, gas tungsten arc welding, and gas metal arc welding. Post-World War II, there was a transition going from riveting to welding, and now pretty much everything is welded. And that can include cars, trucks, ships, submarines, and rockets. And you can imagine the stringent requirements for these applications. Also, uh, large structures such as bridges, buildings, and airports are welded. And next time you're at an airport, look up at the canopy, and you're going to find these giant beams are all welded to each other. And sometimes they look like pipes, sometimes they look like I-beams and structures like that. Also, pipelines, boilers, and pressure vessels, they are also welded, but not airplanes. So what is it so unique about airplanes that it is difficult to use welding technologies over there? So let's look at the requirements for airplanes. So first and foremost, the requirement for airplane, it has to be strong and lightweight material. So any material you choose has to be strong and lightweight. And we combine those two materials to create a new definition called specific strength, which is a ratio of yield strength to density. So specific strength, higher the specific strength, the better. Composites have very high specific strength, but they have other manufacturing challenges and issues with reliability and damage. The second highest is titanium. Uh, however, titanium tends to be very expensive. And so the third option is aluminum, which is essentially used for every practically all commercial airliners. The other property of aluminum, which is very useful, is corrosion resistance. As you can imagine, airline, airplanes are used in all environments, moisture is dry, high, low temperatures, and corrosion resistance becomes an important factor as well. So for those two properties, aluminum tends to be the alloy of choice. However, there are challenges in making a structure from these alloys to the requirements for airplanes. So first and foremost, Airplanes require that any joining technique that you use should produce uniform material properties after joining. So imagine you have two uh, components of aluminum which are to be joined, and you want to join them such that the material properties across the joint are very predictable and uniform. And the reason is there's a lot of deformation and a lot of deflection in airplane structures, such as the wings, for example, which have to uh, flex uh, during operation and predictably flex so that the surface and the properties and the aerodynamics over that remain consistent. The second requirement of any joining technique is there should not be any distortion. So the heat from distortion or any uh, input from the joining technique should not deform uh, the components again, which would affect the aerodynamics. And the third important property is vibration and fatigue resistance. Here again, an airplane is going to take off and land so many times, hundreds of times during the lifetime of its, uh, of during its life and does need to have very high vibration and fatigue resistance. So those three properties, as we can look, we'll look at them later, are well suited for riveting. Other properties which are also in favor of riveting are more logistical in the sense that you can, you have to make complex tooling with simple shapes, Sometimes access to these locations is not easy. Uh, many a times you have to join dissimilar uh, alloys and materials, and that also is in favor of riveting. Also ease of inspection and ease of localized repair. So those properties of riveting are also very valuable for airplane manufacture. So let's start with looking at aluminum alloys, and then we will look at uniqueness of rivets. So aluminum alloys, just like any other alloy family, has many uh, different types of alloys, and those are defined by the primary alloying element in there. So aluminum 1100 is essentially pure aluminum. Uh, aluminum 2000 series 
is has copper as the main alloying element and manganese in 3000 series, silicon in 4000, magnesium in 5000, magnesium and silicon in 6000, and zinc, magnesium, and copper in 7000. Of these alloys, those based on the 2000 series, the 6000 series, and the 7000 series are heat treatable. And here I'm listing you, showing you a list of typical alloys. So 2024 is a commonly used aluminum alloy for aerospace, 6061 and 7075. And here we can see the properties. So in annealed condition, for example, say 2024 has a strength of 29 KSI, but after a proper heat treatment and including some amount of work hardening in some situations, the strength can become very high, up to 70 KSI. Same with the 6,000 series and 7,000 series, these strengths are very strong and they are actually comparable to uh, many steels. The benefit we have in aluminum is that we can combine the two properties of aluminum. On one hand, aluminum can be soft and malleable. On the other hand, we can make it strong. And we do that in a two-step process. So what we can do is we can start with a softer condition of aluminum. You can form the aluminum to a desired shape and then expose it to a certain heat treatment to produce a certain level of strength that is required. So most commonly used aluminum alloys are for structural components, are wings, fuselage, frames, and landing gear. As you can imagine, all of these need to be very strong and durable. There are applications for non-heat treatable alloys. So pretty much every other, every alloy of aluminum is typically there in every uh, airplane. So alloys which are non-heat treatable uh, have, do, do have decent strength and have good corrosion resistance and ductility. And those come in handy in certain applications as well. But here we're gonna focus on the structural uh, alloys for structural applications. And such as say aluminum 6061, the typical process steps would be, you would start with an alloy in the annealed condition. And I, here I say annealed plus, because it doesn't have to be perfectly annealed. It could be quarter hard, half hard, to have the certain strength for to retain that shape after forming. So the strength in that condition could be somewhere greater than say 18 KSI for 6061. Then you take that component, you stamp it, you bend it, roll it, deform it in whatever shape or sh uh, you want. And that uh, maintains the strength. Sometimes depending on how much deformation you impose on it, you can actually increase the strength a little bit by work hardening. And then you can heat treat the alloy to a desired strength. And that heat treatment typically is precipitation hardening. And the strength can go all the way up to 45 KSI in a T6 temper. The, so all of these, annealing, stamping, heat treatment, can go back and forth in different sequences. The problem is the final step, when you take two components and join together, that is going to be welding. And that is where the challenge comes in, that you go from 45 KSI, and if you use any fusion welding techniques, then the strength in the weld and adjacent to the weld can drop significantly. In some cases, depending on the heat input, it can practically go down to annealed condition. And that is where the challenge comes in. So this final assembly step is joining and that causes some problems in predictable nature of that joint strength. So here we are looking at a cross section of TIG welded section of two, compo two pieces of 6061. These are sheets, two millimeter sheets, which is a common thickness used for uh, fuselage applications. And here I have taken two sheets. I have welded them with a filler alloy. And you need to add filler alloys for these heat treatable alloys because otherwise they will crack if you don't use the filler alloy. So you have to have a matching filler alloy to be used. And in this cross section, which has been cut, polished, etched to show the different zones, we can see that there is a wide heat affected zone adjacent to the weld on both sides. Now what happens is we started with the uniform properties of 6061 on both sides, and suddenly we have now three different properties. We have the properties of the fusion zone, properties of the heat affected zone on both sides, and then the base metal, the parent metal uh, strength as well. So the heat affected zone often can be very much softer than the original heat treatment of T6. And that can become a challenge as an application in an airplane structure, because imagine if this part, this joint was part of a wing, 
And when the wing flexes during use, uh, the, de the deformation in the heat-affected zone or deflection in the heat affected zone would be different than in the parent metal and oftentimes very unpredictable. And that causes uh, issues in use as a airplane structure. There is also a risk of internal defects. You can see some defects over here, which are hard to see from the outside and require very specialized techniques such as X-ray and which is always, uh, it's not easily available in all situations. So this produces a risk for airplane structure when we use welds uh, techniques such as uh, shown over here. And that is why we go towards riveting. Now riveting as shown over here on the left in schematic form, this is a cross section. I'm showing you two sheets of aluminum which are being bonded together. One thing about riveting is it has to be a lab joint. So the two parts have to come uh, on top of each other. Then we have to have a drilled hole through which we drop a rivet. And this rivet, as shown, is formed in the factory where the rivets are made. And before riveting, this is what it looks like. We have the primary head, we have the body of the rivet, and there's a small clearance on between the body and uh, the hole in these components of the order of 50 to 100 microns. During riveting, we apply force from the other side with a specially designed tool. And of course, this is not very complicated. These rivets are very small and they're aluminum, so the forces are not very high. And we form a secondary head during the riveting process. And after riveting, this is what the cross section would look like in a completed rivet. The main thing is this, prop, this riveting process is done at room temperature. So there is no change in the properties of the base metal, the parent metal. So if this is 6061 in T6 temper, it will continue to have the same properties after riveting. The rivets provide mechanical connection. So this, as you can see, is a mechanical connection uh, between, uh, so we are just clamping those two together, essentially. I mean, you could have done that with nuts and bolts. So in that sense, rivets are similar to nuts and bolts. But there is a difference. So what happens during riveting is during application of this force to push the rivet into final shape, there is actually a bulge in the body of the rivet. And the body of the rivet expands and fills up that gap between the rivet and the components being joined. And once they are filled up and once there is compressive stress over here, that limits motion, that limits relative motion between those two components and that is what provides the vibration and fatigue resistance. So this is very interesting. So on one hand, riveting is better than welding because there is no change in properties. On the other hand, riveting is better than nuts and bolts because it fills up that the body changes shape and fills up that cavity and provides a vibration and fatigue resistance. So there's a dual benefit. So let's go back to that list of requirements which we have looked at before. We had uniform material properties after joining, yes. Uh, we have vibration and fatigue resistance from riveting, yes. And also we don't have any distortion because there is no heat input in this process of riveting. So there is no uh, significant, any dif distortion uh, during uh, due to riveting. So all of these processes, all of these uh, expectations are met by this process of riveting. Here you can see a photograph of an assembly from an airplane structure. And you can see a lot of rivets which are used for joining uh, sheet metal together and also hinges and brackets. And I'm showing you an expanded view of a small section over here and you can see these rivets and they look like small domes on the surface and that is what the primary head will look like on the surface. The benefit of riveting, as I'd mentioned in the list of requirements, it is also, they are also very easy to install, inspect, remove, and replace with simple tools. So logistically also riveting proves to be a very useful process. And of course you can join dissimilar materials and dissimilar alloys and dissimilar thicknesses without any significant challenges. On planes which fly at uh, fairly high speeds, even these small bumps on the surface can affect the aerodynamics. And that is why there are some different designs called countersunk rivets. So the surface of the rivet is flush with the surface of the airplane's uh, fuselage and the wing surface. And if you are sitting next to a window when you're flying next time, look out the window and look at the surface of the wing 
and you might see you might see small dots, uh, small circles over here, which are essentially the top surface of these countersunk uh, rivets. Another uh, another option of riveting is blind rivets. So there are a lot of applications and situations in airplane manufacturing where we don't have access to the other side to apply that force to push the close the rivet from both sides. So that's where there we have something called a blind rivet. So here we have uh, we are showing you the rivet before welding before riveting. These are two components being joined. There's a rivet. And there's a mandrel, which is typically made of steel. And during riveting, in this case, you push the rivet down from the outer edges and pull the mandrel out from the center. And this process of pushing and pulling actually changes the shape of that rivet and fills up that space and forms a riveted connection. Here you can see that there is going to be a hole. In, and and at, once you apply a certain amount of force, the mandrel breaks off and you are left with this uh, structure over here as a blind rivet. As you can see from the surface, you're gonna to expect to see a small hole in there, and that is what you see, these rivets with small holes on the top, and looking at them, you can tell that these are blind rivets. So rivets have fantastic advantages, and they seem to work really well for the expectations for airplanes, and that is the reason why rivets are commonly used as a manufacturing technique compared to conventional welding uh, technologies. But what is the future of riveting? <clears throat> While rivets are still widely used, new options are becoming available. Uh, one of them is friction stir welding. So friction stir welding is a solid state process. And I'll be putting out a video on friction stir welding uh, later on. And friction stir welding does not raise the temperature of the aluminum to the melting point, so it does not lose all its, all its strength. So friction stir welding is becoming an option for many of the joints in airplane manufacturing. The second option which is coming on strong is carbon reinforced composites. They are getting stronger and more durable and more easy uh, for manufacturing. And uh, so those are getting more and more popular even in commercial airliners. And structural adhesives are also uh, now capable of making joints and bonds which satisfy the requirements of airplane uh, expectations. So these adhesives, uh, the beauty is that you can combine adhesives along with riveting. So you can actually apply an adhesive between the two sheets which you're trying to join. On top of that, we can have a rivet uh, for added strength and sealing as well. So there are many benefits, many alternatives which are coming along which will partially replace riveting, but I don't expect riveting to completely go away. But for example, on 787, they say that 50% of composite materials uh, are being used uh, instead of aluminum, and that has resulted in significant reduction in weight. Well, thank you for your time. If you're interested in learning more about welding and joining, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, there are multiple videos on different playlists, such as laser welding, arc welding, resistance welding, metallurgy, and design. And I'm sure uh, you're going to find something useful over there. I want to wish you again the very best in learning more about welding and joining, and take care. Thank you.